Father, we thank you so much that we can be here together. We thank you for this conference. Lord, we thank you for how you have been over these last 14 years bringing your people together so that we could attempt to do your will and to really, in fact, work out our salvation, although we understand that it's absolutely free and it's by grace. But in gratitude to you for that grace, Lord, and understanding your call in our life, that we are working and respond to that so that we can maintain the joy that we need to give us the energy to do your will. And so, Lord, guide us and lead us. And then, Lord, we pray for your presence this morning. We are standing on your promise that for two or three gathered together in your name, that you would be here in our midst and that we would uh, uh, learn from you and that your spirit would do his work this morning, would, be, would lead us and teach us and help us to love you more. So guide us this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name for his sake. Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I'm going to talk about our mind this morning, the mind of Christ. And, uh, and I'm sort of a, a one-track-minded person anyway. And so let me get this one thing that I want to get off my mind so I can then get back on the mind that I need. And that's at our 1230. We want people who has a concern about Africa and the condition of Africa and how we can, uh, what we can do as CCDA people to uh, relate to the indigenous movement in Africa and how can we do that. And so there are going to be people uh, at 1130. We're going to be in room uh, two, 201. And it's at 12.30. It's at 12.30. 12.30. That means you have to get your lunch box and bring your lunch up there. And we're going to try to spend uh, an hour and a half together. Uh, listen to the indigenous people. And then we thinking together of what we can do to work with what is already happening in Africa. The African people have been colonized for too long. And Christianity participated in that colonization. And we have milked Africa of its resources. Now how can we, the church, come along beside uh, the people and, and help them to do what they need to do in, in, in Africa? And, and so we are not so much sending people to Africa, although we do want to get a team of people to go to Africa. But we want to go to Africa to learn and from them and to see how we can work with them. And Pastor Gus Roma, who is my friend from Philadelphia, uh, he's going to be there and he will be one of the people who are going to be leading this session uh, together as we listen to the people who are there and as he tell us about the condition uh, in Africa and how we can learn how to relate to them. This to me is a very, very important uh, uh, time. We are stewards of this wonderful gospel and God has entrusted it into our hand. And now it is our task to do a good job in our neighborhood. And that's what we're about, neighborhood and community development. But we understand our mission is to cure this gospel to the end of the world. Uh, that's what the Holy Spirit came to guide us into. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the othermost parts of the world. That's our mandate, and we can never forget about that, and that we got to figure out ways that we can do that. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, at 1230 <laughs> on the second floor. Bring your lunch, uh, 101, uh, 201, and we're going to have a good time there together. Okay, so open your Bibles now as we continue our Bible studies this morning. Open your Bible back to... Philippians, Philippians, the little book of Philippians, and we're going to start there. Now, let's see what we got, we're going to put on our mind this morning, and what's behind all of this. We are talking about it as we have tried to practice it in CCDA, uh, that we are not only being 
hearers of the word because the Bible said if you be just hearers of the word and not doers, you will deceive yourself. And then you'll just become uh, uh, talkers about the word but not become doers of the word because real faith then works itself out in good works. And so we can't separate them because faith without works is dead. And what we are seeing is that Jesus called us to be his workmanship. We are here as, a, as, a, as the replacement and the continuation of Jesus Christ's body here on earth. Jesus now uh, do not have a, a, a earthly body outside of our body. And Jesus is now living his life out through you and me here on earth. And we constitute his body. And then he gives us gifts and skills. And then he calls us to be involved in certain ways in the neighborhood, in the community. But we all should have enough unity. We're going to see that this morning in order that we can be his body to do his will at a given, given place. We also understand that the, the church, the local church, is the gathering of that body in a local community. That's the local church. The local church needs to see itself as being capable of doing God's will in that neighborhood because it's the body of Christ. That's why we need the church. We need the church in the neighborhood. And I really enjoyed the message last night. It was so profound to this congregation here. We know basically this congregation. We was the young folks who went out and started the parachurch organization. We got a concern for the poor and the dying in the community. And we went out and we started health centers. We started business enterprises. We started doing these things. But as we went along, we was able to see that none of this would have any long-term uh, effect in the community unless there was a body of Christ there. There was a collective group of people there who related together. And the ministry itself could help people to come to know Jesus Christ, but it couldn't do the work that needs to be done in order to disciple those people. And people need to be discipled in a local congregation in the community. We understand that now. We still are going to reach out. We're still going to start health centers. We're still going to start our enterprises. We're going to still be, be developing law firms and, and clinics and doing these kind of things in the community. We're going to still be developing our business enterprises in the community. But the central piece in all of that is that that is anchored in a local congregation there that we are calling people to Jesus Christ so they might know him and they might be in fellowship together. That's what CCDA is all about. Now, we, we understand the virtue and, and, and the goodness within the community church. And we have many community churches in the community. Commu the community church it cannot impact the neighborhood sufficiently so that we need to plant churches in those communities that the community church works with us in order to, to, to make certain that that church can do its work within that neighborhood and that community. And so we are working together and we are looking for ways to work together. And we are not out just condemning what is going on. Uh, you know, I take it that the world is somewhat in a, an apostasy, that the world is somewhat going in the wrong direction. So I don't have to give a lot of time to that. What I'm giving my time to is trying to equip the church so that it can do the work that it needs to do at the base level, at the community level. And so let's go then to our lesson this morning. What I want to do this morning, uh, we want to talk about, uh, I guess it's um, verse 5 in chapter 2 is going to be our theme verse out of which we're going to do our teaching here this morning. And let's listen at the apostle here in verse uh, Five, when he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I, I think this could really be uh, the theme verse for this whole book uh, here. And you can see that and feel that as you go through the, as we go through the book. We're going to see it. And we're going to see that we are, what we are doing here is looking at 
the mind of Christ through the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Okay? You know, that's what we want to do here. Is look at that. Because he tells us when we are converted, he says here, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know and understand what is the perfect will of God. And so we got to have, look at the mind, and so we're going to look at it through the Apostle Paul here this morning. Now, he's in jail, and we talked about that yesterday. He's in jail in Rome, and he had uh, established this church. This was one of his churches that he got the vision to, go, to take the gospel into Europe. This was Paul's first uh, mission journey there. And it was there, you remember, he was locked in jail. And, and it's out of that being in prison there uh, that he started that church. And he started that church with the jailer who had beat them up and put them in jail. They saw it. And, and that jailer, you remember, asked the question that we asked all the time. Uh, what must I do to be saved? And Paul told him how to be saved, that what he had to do was to put his faith in Jesus Christ, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Not only that, but he said, and your household. You know, if we could bring something of a household type of salvation back, it would be very critical right now, today. Because the main problem we have in our society, and the main problem is the breakdown of the family. And the family need, people really need to be nurtured and cherish in their faith at the family level. I remember once I was in a, I was in a uh, Rock Valley, Iowa, and this stuck with me. I was in Rock Valley, Iowa, in this little Dutch ghetto, wonderful Dutch ghetto. And I went out there, and there was no black folks nowhere around. I was the only black that they had ever, probably some of them had ever seen out there. And these folks were my friends. And, uh, and I was just getting to know them. And that Sunday morning, I went to church, and of course, in Iowa, in a Dutch village, uh, everybody go to church. And there's a church in every neighborhood, in every community, and they usually walk to that church. They don't need big parking lots in Iowa because they can walk almost. They're neighborhood churches. I went there, and all of these people was there. You know, my pride got into me a little bit. I thought, maybe all these people have come to see me and to hear me, you, you know, and, and all of them there. And so I really, my pride was really getting at me. And I really wanted to be certain that these folks had come out there to hear me. And so I, I said to uh, the pastor, uh, Brother Dan, I said, uh, Brother Dan, how many members do you have in this church? You know, uh, and I was hoping he could say, all of these people came this morning to hear you. That's what I wanted him to say, you know, that's what my pride was saying. You know, how many members we got in this church? Brother Dan just said, didn't even act like he heard me almost to say, uh, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't count members, we count families. He said, we are here to minister to the family and try to train the family so they can go back and minister to their kids and take responsibility for the children's life. What we're doing today is that we are turning our children over to the institution. And we're turning almost everybody, and then we're faulting the school. We're faulting all these things. And, of course, the family did not do its work at the family level. And so we do need to bring that household idea of the family. But that would assume, too, that there is somewhat of an intact family. That makes an assumption that there is a man there to help give them that condition of love, and there's a mother there to give them that uh, unconditional love so they can grow and develop. I understand all of that. Then all of that in this society. So let's, let's look then at, 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 our, at our lesson here this morning. As we go to our lesson here this morning, see what Paul is talking about. As we look at the, uh, the mind of Christ here. Now, what is it to have the, the mind of Christ? How can you have the mind of Christ? Well, you, have, you get the mind of Christ when you come to know Christ. You ought to then have the mind of Christ initially. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Holy Spirit come, and the Holy Spirit comes there to try to give you and to help you to have the mind of, of Christ. What is sort of the other thing you need to know about the mind of Christ that can help you? You need to know that Christ saved us in order that we might be his servant, his servants, that we have accepted him as Lord of our lives. And that we have now turned our life over to him. And that we are no longer supposed to over-concentrate on ourselves. Now, I find as I go into the world uh, that the greatest problem, one of the greatest problems I find with people, the people who are the most sick in our society, is people who have over-concentrated on themselves. Jesus comes to save us from ourselves. When Jesus says, we, we, when, when I see you to say this in the church, I say a verse like, Jesus said, if any person come after me, let him deny himself. And people start squeaking. Uh, they don't, they, they, uh, Jesus is saying the best thing he can say for you, to get rid of yourself, to stop thinking about yourself. When I go into prison, I find that what have got them there is an over-concentration on themselves. Uh, when I go into divorce courts, I find that there is one of those parties that have over-concentrated on themselves. When I go into insane asylum, I see most people is over-concentrated on themselves. And what prisons do to people, and prisons just sort of usually, unless you got your mind, have the mind of Christ, prison really causes you to do nothing but concentrate on yourself. Because the art of prison is to take away all of your own decision-making power. The art of prison is to not to let you utilize your mind anymore. The art of prison is to stop you from thinking because your thoughts is what got you in here, in, in prison. And so what happens then to people, they put all of their energy on themselves. And why they even go through religious experiences while they're in prison. If they don't have the guidance and the protection and the body of people to be around with them to learn so they can learn how to rethink again, they're going to make the same decision they made that got them into prison because you have to have a point of reference in order to think. The thing, where you think is that you remember the decision you made the last time, and you make the decision based on decision-making because you've been practicing how to make decisions. So when a person go in prison, what happens to them is the last decision they made of their own. That's what prison is about. And then when you let them out of prison, if you're not there with them to help them, what they're going to do within a short time is they have to think about how to make decisions. And they have to think about basically how was the last decision I made. You have to have a point of reference. And so what they do then is that they usually make this, the decision that got them in there, and that decision carries them back into prison. That's why this recidivism rate is so high. And that's why the need for the local churches to really develop these, like, a nurturing halfway house for these prisoners. One of the things that we've done in Mississippi, working for now almost two years uh, with the prison system there, and not only are we affecting uh, uh, Mississippi, but we have national relationships to the federal government. And they are now beginning to see that the most important issue in reducing the prison population is the mentoring those people get a year before they come out of prison and then to tie to them a mentor who's going to be with them a year after they come out of prison we see that as a, and now the government we are the government now is taking up that model and in mississippi now we're just getting a sizable grant that's our state is getting a sizable grant for us to begin to implement this whole idea of finding those young folks, those that come to know Jesus Christ, work with them, that last year is so critical. You know, we'll be doing all this other thing while they're in there. But that last year, 
uh, we're going to specialize then in meeting with them. And we also work with the idea is that we can put them in sort of like a, a, a separate institution within the institution where they then won't then have to be with those other hard people. See, and, and so then when they come out, they can come back. Now, I'm saying this because this is where my heart is at. Because there is too many, absolutely too many. When I go out to the prison, I go out and stay a day. I go out and speak to the juvenile hall in the prison. And there's going to be 500 of the beautiful young uh, black kids there from uh, 13 to 17 years old. Then I'm going to go out to the, the, the big prison. That's who I work with in the big prison. And we got masses of those young folk. And so the prime of the black community now is in prison. And what I'm telling those young folks, when I go out there to them, I say, don't see this as a dead end street. You know, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, get into the GED program, get into the, we have even junior colleges program and college programs in there, get into that and see this as an opportunity. And I say to them, you would probably would have been dead if you didn't, if they wouldn't have caught you and brought you here. And so don't waste your time here. And I said, great people get their skills and their determination while they're in prison and come out. And you, those are the people who really change society. Change society. People who've had a chance to get their mind together and to concentrate and determine what they were going to do uh, in, with their life. And so let's go then. Let's continue now to look at our, our text. Let's begin here at... at uh, at verse 1 of chapter 2. Now, now you, could tie, you could tie where I left off at yesterday in chapter 12. You can tie that to uh, Paul's uh, mind because Paul did not allow the condition that he was in to become so negative that it would stop him from doing the will of God. Fact. Paul saw whatever state that he found himself in that he wanted to use that situation to bring glory and honor to Christ. And so Paul saw him being in jail as almost God's, at least God's opportunity for him to minister. And he's going to say by him being in jail that, and, and is in jail and, and speaking out, and being able to impact the, the, the prison guards and the people that runs the government, the palace guard, that he was winning them to Jesus Christ and that their whole attitude was going to be changed and that the other Christian out there was going to have a great advantage, opportunity to preach the gospel because he was in prison. So Paul saw his imprisonment as God's way of carrying out his will for his life. And that's the way we need to do it. Some people complain about everything. And they are just negative. Negative. The Christian should be known by joy. Now this is the theme. If you want to know what is the real theme of this epistle here. Is it's having the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is to have joy. Is to have joy. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so you cannot allow the situation to create a negative attitude that you don't have the joy to have the strength to do the will of God. And if you're looking at this book and try to pick out what Paul talks about more, of course, he's always talking about the will of God. But he's also talking about the, the mind of Christ. And he's also talking about the joy that that brings in his life. That's the theme of this book. And so condition and situation should not have anything to do. We, you ought to see that situation as an opportunity and ask God, you know, what do you want me to do with this unique situation now that you have put me into? And how can I use this situation to bring glory and honor uh, to you? And so let's begin then. He says that in those verses, those verses from 12 up into where we're at now. He was just basically explaining 
the condition that he was in and how he was using that situation to bring glory to God. But now let's look into his mind. Let's look into how he was able to do that. And he says here then in verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, uh, in it bowels of mercy, he's, he's, he's saying all these words. He says, now, with all of that, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, like-minded here. And this, he, he will get into that as uh, having the same love, being a one accord and one mind. Uh, this is, this is, this one accordness and this one mind has to do with this mind that he's talking about here, but it has always also to do with knowing who you are in Christ because you are now here as a servant. And then it's the will of God that you have the one mind that's in. It's not that you have become a follower of some cult person who tells you everything to do. Uh, that's what cults do to you. They remove your mind out and put the mind of their leaders in. And I can really tell when I'm talking to people is whether or not, when I'm talking to some religious person, I can really sort of tell right away is whether or not it's sort of a cult. Because they're going to talk more all about their leader. They're going to be talking to you about their leader. Well, that's not the idea. Paul wants you to have the mind of Christ in you, but he also wants to free your mind so that that mind can be creative, can be creative, because it's with your mind you're going to accomplish things in, 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 a, in, a, in life. And so he says now, we're to have this, so this oneness here, that don't mean that we all have to do different things. It's what he's talking about here is what we call real unity in diversity, real unity in exercising that unique talent that God has given to you. You, 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 you know, I, it don't make no difference. If I start to get in the choir, I can't make music. I can't sing. You, you know, so no sense in me getting in the choir. You, you understand? But there's other things that I can do. You, you, you understand? In life. And so we have to then have the unity. I know that there's a need for music in the church so we can worship and praise God. I know that, and I'm going to support that but I can't make that happen, make that happen. And so the unity is in diversity. The unity is in knowing the calling and then to know God's calling upon my life and then also to know God's bigger goal, his bigger goal. And his bigger goal is that the word of God might go forth. That's God's bigger goal because God uses his word to accomplish his will here on earth. I guess you need to understand that. Uh, faith is nothing more than believing what God says he will do. Faith is putting your faith in Christ and then living by his word, living in obedience to his word. That's what makes Abraham the father of our faith. Abraham heard the voice of God and spent the rest of his life trying to carry out the will of God, the will of God. And so we have to know, and the will of God was this, through you, Abraham, all the families of the world will be blessed. He didn't limit that to some little old bit of limit. Thank God's will is bigger than your little neighborhood. God's will is bigger than your own desire. And, that, and that's what gets me again with this name and claim it stuff. You would almost think God's blessing upon me is going to help you that much. It might and it might not. Uh, God's blessing upon me might help you and it might not. Because it might take too much of the blessing for me. You understand? And so just my being blessed is no guarantee that God's will is going to go forward in the world. And, they, and, and so the churches today, men of the churches today, that's what they're teaching. And what hurts me is that they are gobbling up almost all these young folks that I've almost put my life in trying to help them to get a vision for their neighborhood and for their community. Stay in school and get some skills and get some good paying jobs. 
And, and now, those people, those people now, is flocking to what they're doing is turning their success into God. And they are making prosperity itself God. And so what they are really doing is serving themselves. Is serving themselves. And, and the main people who are being blessed the most is those pastors themselves. I want you to know that that's a, pl that's a plight upon the urban community. Because we need to be utilizing these resources, pooling our resources, starting credit unions doing things together so our money and our resources can have some impact in our neighborhood and that we can make some job. In my neighborhood that I live in, it is the new wonderful immigrants who come in and they provide the goods and the services. Most of my good talented young black folks there is trying to get out of there and buy them a house somewhere else. And, and so they are sort of like migrants there in the community, and if I'm going to get some services, I have to get those services from the new immigrant. And see, every neighborhood, if that neighborhood is going to be prosperous, that every neighborhood ought to be able to provide some works and goods and services for the people that are in that neighborhood. And so our young folks also can learn how to work and experience work in our neighborhood and community. And what they experience in a lot of my neighborhood is they are on the streets selling drugs. And don't think that these young folks are ignorant. They are using their mind. They got these cell phones. They got these calculators in their pocket. And then they understand all of this stuff. But the work they have before them and the models they have before them, the model they have before them is not of work within the neighborhood and not enough, especially, of men's work. We find our men gathered together at some place together doing very little in our community. And so we've got to, we've got to uh, change that. Well, let me continue here then. Uh, having the mind of Christ, what kind of mind we need to have here. He, and he says here, let nothing be done, in verse 3, let nothing be done to strife or vainglory. Uh, uh, what is vainglory? Here is really doing it for somebody else to see. Doing it that it might bring glory to me. Uh, yes, the Presbyterian catechism is right. Is that all that we do should be to bring glory and honor and praise to God. We exist to bring glory and praise to God and not to ourselves. And not to ourselves. Don't over-focus on yourself. I say to young folks in the morning, I, uh, I'm an early riser. Uh, uh, I get up very early. And, uh, and I do my study early in the morning. And then after I do that, I, uh, I go to the bathroom and I brush my teeth, take a shave, take a shower, and put a little stuff on my hand, hand and put a little soap down in my arm. And, and, and boy, I'm about finished with myself. I'm about finished with myself, you, you know, not much more attention on myself. You, it's going it's to destroy you. Oh, the best thing that Jesus says to you, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Now, that's not an abandoning yourself. That's putting yourself in the hands of a God who loves you, who knows the hair on your head, who's going to provide for you. And in that same passage, he says, don't you think if a child asks me for bread, I'm going to give him a snake? He says in that passage, he said, he said, look at Solomon and look at the lilies of the valley. Who supplies all of that? And he said, I will supply. Then he says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the things that we need to seek that righteousness with will be added to do his work and to do his, his will. We almost heard that sermon last night, didn't we? I heard it when the brother said, silver and gold have we none. And they was planting churches, starting with what they had. And what they had was the Spirit of God. And what people had was their home. And they would go into those homes. And from there, churches would be developed. Men of our folks in our organization, they always come to me. And they ain't going to do nothing unless they get a proposal funded. I, I will do this if I get a proposal funded. If you are really convicted... 
that this is what God wants you to do, go out and start doing it. Start doing it. And then if you start doing it pretty good and people can see that it's meeting the need, then people are going to join with you and help you to do it. You got to go out and use your own resources first. The story we have of real helping people is found in the story of the Good Samaritan. That's a powerful story. The Good Samaritan utilized all of his own resources. All of his own resources. When he used those up, then he re recognized the fact that he had to go in debt. Had to go in debt to do that. He said, oh, any more, then I'll pay it when I come back. And we have that story. So we start with what we have, and we utilize that, and we do that well. And then other folks will then come along and see the value of that. Communicate it to your friends. Talk to your friends about it. Think of every good way you can let people know and see what you're doing in the neighborhood. And then those people will come along. But what you got to have, though, you got to have some integrity. People are not going to give to you if you don't. And one of our problems in our community, most of us haven't had much to manage, so we haven't learned how to manage. And so what we need to do then is recognize that and get somebody to help us manage what we got. Because the person who's going to have to help you is the person who have been able to manage well. That's why they got what they got. And so they're looking at your weakest point when they come to you. Your weakest point when they come to you. And if you can say then that, yes, anything you give to me is going to be managed in some kind of a creative way, first thing they're going to ask you for is a financial statement. That's a management piece. That's why they want to see that. They want to see how you've been utilizing what you already had. And if you wasn't doing that well, they ain't going to give you nothing else. And so most of the people running around and their work is not going forward is because they don't understand their own weakness. And then get the people around them to support them. People do this to me all the time. I'd be out somewhere in Mississippi trying to get a health center going, telling people we need a health center in this place. And somebody will come to me and say, uh, are you a real medical doctor? I said, no, I'm not even a real nurse. That's what, but I know when people get sick, and I know when they get well, and, and, and I read it, if you help me, I can go hire me a doctor to do that. I don't have to have to do all that. People put that on you all the time. When, when I be speaking, I be, I watch the question come forth. I'd be saying, we need a health center. And they'll start asking me medical questions. I, I don't know that. They'll start asking me uh, uh, these financial questions. I said, I don't, in fact, I don't even like to talk with accountants because they, they talk like lawyers. They talk about deficits and critics and all of that. I said, all I want to ever know is how much money is in the bank, how much I need, and how I can use that money to achieve my goals in life. And so you don't have to know everything. You have to know what you, better yet, to know what you don't know. And then be able to get the people to come along beside of you to do those things. And that's the way our ministry will go for. I meet so many of our folks that have been trying to do ministry too long. And the problem with them is they won't let anybody else. They don't trust anybody around them to come along beside of them to help them to achieve the work that they need. Here. And so let's go back here. Vain glory. Vain glory. So let nothing be done through vain glory, but, and, but loveness and, and, and lo loneliness and of a kind mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. And that's an, loneliness here means walking in a sense of humility. You know, and that, that's another thing that we are doing. Our religion is becoming a, a religion of triumphant. It's becoming a religion of bigness in, 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 in life. You know, the Bible says that God resists the proud. He gives the grace to the humble. And, and so when you are walking around all this time bragging about what you are doing, uh, God is not getting a whole lot of glory out of that. God wants us to work. The, the Bible talks about it, and I read it often. 
It's over there in Proverbs. It says there are six things that God dislikes or he hates. Then he's, then he's almost like the writer thanks for a minute. Thanks for a serpent. And then he said, oh, no, it's seven. <laughs> it's seven. And the seventh one is the worst one. <laughs> God hates six things, but there's a seventh one that he hates the most. What does it say? Pride. Pride. And pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction in life. And so God wants us to live with a sense of humility. Uh, not over bragging on ourselves in life, but walking in humility. That's important. That's the mind of Christ. Now he's going to explain with that in mind, he going to explain to us then what the mind of Christ looked like. Look what he says here. He said, let, let, every, let every man, uh, look not every man on his own things, but every person on the things of others. See, we ought to be others focused, not me focused. We ought to be others focused to be blessed and not us being blessed. We ought to see ourselves as being, having been blessed so that we can become a blessing to others. And so we're not serving God to be blessed. We are serving God to give a blessing. I think that was a uh, uh, mistake on Wilkerson's wonderful book. Wonderful book. What was the name of his wonderful book? What was it? No, no. Jabez prayer. People so misunderstood that one isolated verse over there in the scripture. And they used that to reinforce their greed. And they used that to reinforce, and that's not, I don't think, what, what Wilkerson meant. I know it wasn't what the passage was talking about. Uh, Jabez was born in pain. And his mother had so much pain in his, in his birth. And he watched his mother in pain. And he said, God, if you bless me, I want to be a pain reliever. I want you to use me to release other people from their pain and to be a blessing. This was no prosperity thing. And we took it around. The reason it sold so many is that people took it the wrong way. We are not here to seek our own. We are here to look out for the welfare of others. We should be walking close enough to God to believe that God can meet our needs. And now we want to be a need. Let's, let's finish here this morning. Let's look at the mind then of Christ. Then verse 5. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, you understand the reason Jesus was put to death and the thinking of people's mind in that day, that the Son of God, the Son of one, is more important than, than the father himself are at least equally important as the father himself. The son was a direct extension from the father. That's the way people thought in those days. And the reason they put Jesus to death is because he said that he was the son of God making himself equal with God. That's why they put him to death. So when we talk about God, we're talking about God being revealed to us so that we can know him in the person of Jesus Christ. In order for us to know God, God had to take on a body. He had to become the second Adam. He had to become like us. We can't know God, really know him apart from Jesus Christ. A Jesus Christ is the express image of an invisible God. And that's why we say then in the way to God is through Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus himself could say, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me.
And so this verse here says here that Jesus was God and why he was equal with God. Now he have to close himself in flesh, but he also have to close himself in humility, in humility. The most, po most powerful you are, the more powerful you, you, you are as a person, the more humble you ought to be in society, you know, so that people can hear your message, so that people can hear your message. And they can hear Jesus' message because he loved us enough and he humbled himself even unto death. And we hear his message because after his death, God highly exalted him. Look what he says here now as we finish here. But he made of himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made like unto you and I. And he was being found in fashion. I'm reading every morning at 5.30 once a week with my youngest daughter, Elizabeth. I've been doing that with men, boys so long. She came to me and it was the joy of my life. My youngest daughter said, Daddy, would you do a study with me? And I said, yeah, I'd do a study with you. And you have to come at 5.30 because I got too much else to do the rest of the day. You have to get here at 5.30. And so she come at 5.30. And we are reading through the Gospel of John together. And when you read through the Gospel of John, what you see so clearly there is that Jesus claimed to be God, and he was God. He is the shepherd, and he's the gate to the shepherd's door. And the only way to get to God is to come through Jesus Christ. And so we've been just having a great time uh, together reading that. And then uh, one of the things that I keep telling to her, I said, honey, you got to get your life together, and you got to begin to live in truth. Because God is, you've got to get that hypocrisy out of your life. You've got to keep, take that cheating out of your life. You've got to stop that smoking. You've got to stop doing all these things behind, uh, back. You are punishing yourself. You are punishing yourself. The Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have to organize our life around what we know a hypocrite is somebody who try to be one thing and recognize itself that there's another one in life. And so you got to begin to walk in the light as he's in light. Let me finish then with this passage, and we'll be finished for today. Let this mind be in you. Uh, what was I at here? He was found in a fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And because of his obedience, God have exalted him. If you people, if we want to be exalted, and it's going to talk about this, he's going to be exalted so high that every knee will have to bow and every tongue will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All of that starts, though, with you and me humbling ourselves, walking in humility, walking before God, giving God the credit for the blessing in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord, thank you that we could spend this time here together. Now bless your people, guide them and lead them. We ask this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen.